Welcome to Tech in the Right Direction, the podcast. Let's take tech in the right direction to drive social change and close the employment, pay, and culture gap for women in technology. This podcast is focused on helping turn ideas into action and create opportunities for women to advance in the dynamic technology industry. I hope this podcast will inspire and motivate you to encourage more women and girls to seek or grow a career as a woman in technology. Stories about the journey of amazing women in the tech field starts right now. Welcome to Tech in the Right Direction. This week, I'll be speaking with Sarah Curry. Sarah is a five-time AWS security consultant for Amazon Web Services. Sarah works closely with AWS customers to architect, implement, and deploy AWS cloud security solutions that streamline their security process and enables workflows to maintain a high standard of compliance and quality. Additionally, Sarah is an advocate for mentorship and increasing the presence of underrepresented individuals in the cloud security space. She is a co-director for the AWS Women and ProServes Community Engagement Committee, founder of the AWS ProServe Women in the Security Group, and sits on the associate board of Gilda's Club Middle Tennessee. Welcome to the show, Sarah. I'm so excited to have you on. Yeah, I'm, I'm so excited. Thanks so much for inviting me. Sure. So let's get started. Um, Sarah, can you share with us your career journey and how you got to where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. So I have kind of an interesting story in terms of how I got to um, being a security consultant at AWS. I actually came from a non-tech background. Um, so back in college, I actually majored in management and marketing with an emphasis in healthcare. Um, and from there, I moved to DC and worked at a lobbying firm um, on advocating for different patient initiatives um, and decreasing cost of medicine like insulin. Um, and I actually got put on a project that they estimated would complete in 15 years. And mm -hmm. as you know, in tech, things move a lot faster than that. So mm -hmm. I pivoted um, over into a more technical aspect of working as a project manager um, at a tech startup in DC. And from there, I was working with a lot of engineers. Um, and as we all know, things break a lot with software. So I was always trying to look at the console and debug. And one of the female engineers actually started meeting with me to teach me JavaScript. And she one day sat me down and was like, you know what, you should become an engineer. I think you would really like it. And you have you know, kind of a good background to help integrate other skills. Mm -hmm. So 2018, I did a software engineering boot camp and was a software engineer um, for about a year when AWS reached out to me. And now I'm doing um, consulting for different AWS customers in terms of security. So in improving their cloud security. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so I feel like I've come full circle because now I'm working on HIPAA compliance in the healthcare industry, and I work with a lot of our AWS healthcare customers. So um, nice. that background knowledge that I got <laughs> back in college helps a lot. So that's great. Um, just for our listeners, tell tell us a little bit more about what a engineer is, so that they can kind of get a uh, feeling or understanding of your role. Yeah, absolutely. So software engineers work on, you know, it can be the front end, which is what you see in terms of a website when you go to a website and you have the user interface, mm -hmm. or you can do back end, which is, you know, where you're going to be storing all of your infrastructure and data. So I always like to explain it to people who, you know, might not be familiar. When you go onto a website, maybe google.com and you search something, the back mm -hmm. end is what's retrieving all of that information. And, um, mm -hmm you know, n new IP addresses. So a lot of that's building um, different features and services. Um, and in terms of security, a lot of it is ensuring that you have your defenses up to prevent any attacks and also reduce human risk. Very nice. Um, so do you like the front end or the back end better? Like where did you start and did you stay with that? So I actually started in front end. A lot of boot camps focus on front end because mm -hmm. it's 
it's a really good way to get your feet wet. Um, and I really do like front end because it's essentially a lot of the user experience that you're focusing on, mm -hmm. but I actually prefer back end. I think it's really interesting how you architect um, the different services that you have. And personally, front end, I'm not patient enough for the design aspect. If you've ever used CSS, it's it can be a little mm -hmm. tedious with like yep. moving the width of the page. <laughs> and and time so that wasn't for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and even picking out fonts and things like that. So that's why I moved to back end. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And, you know, it really depends on the person's um, passion and where they are they feel they are better at. So you could do either one and there's obviously some variety in there. Yeah. Um, tell us about the boot camp that you took. How long was it? So the boot camp that I did um, was based in New York and it was a three month course. So three many months. of them okay. range from three month um, into some of them can be almost a year long. I know a lot of universities are actually getting into the boot camp space where they'll do um, 24 weeks. So it started off with learning JavaScript um, and then diving into uh, essentially front end and how you manage that and then also going into the back end. So we um, learned Node.js and SQL um, and, and then we had our final project, which funny enough, mine was actually recreating Amazon's website. This was <laughs> like two, three years before I before. worked at Amazon. So kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. That is funny. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Well, that's great. And you got so much experience. And then, you know, even though you took the boot camp, you went on and get got hands on experience, which is actually more valuable than actually the learning. The learning is important, but doing it is also very critical. Yeah, absolutely. And I think with, um, you know, going on getting hands on, it's so important because that's really how you reinforce your learning. Um, right. You know, if I did that camp in 2018 and then I didn't continue to work in the space, you just lose the skills like you, you would for it. any industry. Yep. You don't use it, you lose it. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So as you know, this podcast is focused on bridging the employment pay and culture gap for women in technology. What are you seeing in the industry today? Yeah, absolutely. So um, a report that I find super interesting is McKinsey's Women in the Workplace report um, mm -hmm. that focuses on women in the workplace over the last year and especially how uh, we've been dealing with the pandemic. And it's really interesting because it highlights the stressors that women are facing in terms mm -hmm. of their personal life, um, you know, predominantly being the caregivers for either their aging parents or children. Um, and also, as well as work, where, you know, it's hard to bring your full self to work when you're, you know, stressed out about uh, getting sick with the pandemic or racial tensions and things like that. So mm -hmm. a lot of what I'm seeing um, is unfortunately a lot of women are leaving the workforce just mm -hmm. because, you know, it's becoming too overwhelming and um, you, they want to focus on helping their children with remote learning. Um, so that's definitely something that's been really tough that I've seen. And also in terms of, you know, talking about um, the employment and pay gap, um, as well as culture gap, I, I've seen a lot of companies focusing on diversity and hiring, which is amazing, but not mm -hmm. necessarily always looking at inclusion. So mm -hmm. what does it mean to have, have, you know, a black woman on your team and making sure that they feel like their voice is versus just mm -hmm. hiring them and then some companies stopping at that? So definitely something I've seen um, in terms of, you know, just the culture gap. And also, um, we've actually kind of spoke about this before, but I'm a millennial. Um, so I definitely recognize the like generational differences um, mm -hmm. in terms of the workforce. And that's not even specifically related to women per se. But, um, you know, we've talked about that a lot of women, depending on if you're a millennial or a baby boomer, um, millennials are way more likely to work nine to five uh, because mm -hmm. work life balance is very important. And, you know, we grow up seeing our mothers putting in long hours and that's not the life we want for ourselves or our children. So I've definitely seen that as a difference, too. Yeah, very, very good insights. Um, we're seeing a lot of the same things. You know, I love what you said about, um, you know, the diversity part. It checks the box, but 
the, the inclusion part is more important than diversity. They both go together, but you have to have inclusive uh, environments for people to thrive and to really get the true benefit of, of bringing in diverse people with different thoughts and different ideas. So that's, that's really, uh, you're spot on with that. And then the generational differences, I think is very important as well, because different age groups um, are different. You know, it doesn't matter if you're male, female, um, or, you know, what your role is, it doesn't really matter. It is, there's a generational difference. And what you said, you're spot on with millennials, that work-life balance is very, very important. And so you have to give them that type of environment to work with so that they can thrive. Yeah, absolutely. And something else that was really interesting that I saw is that a lot of millennial women have had trouble being um, individual contributors under baby boomer women. And when they dug into it, it was because, um, you know, women that are of the baby boomer age had to compete and be the sole woman in whatever team. Mm -hmm. um, where obviously, thankfully, that's changing now. Um, so sometimes there's that discrepancy where um, women that are baby boomers don't necessarily want to mentor younger women because they're afraid that they'll come and take their jobs, which I thought was mm -hmm. really interesting um, because it kind of shows just the perception difference, too, of how the industry is changing to open more yeah. roles um, yeah. to people of all ages. Very true. So let's talk a little bit about male-dominated industries. I know IT is definitely one, but you also mentioned lobbyists, lawyers, engineers. So as a woman, how do you navigate this world in a male dominated industry. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, it's been really interesting because of all of the different industries, such as lobbying world um, and law and engineers, there's different, you know, uh, I guess issues that come along with each workplace. Um, as you can imagine, with working in government and lobbying, it's a lot of uh, men in particular that are. I guess have been around in the industry for a long time. And so they have set ways and how they perceive, you know, business going. So for example, with lobbying, um, a lot of the business is conducted over dinner um, or lunches. And so I would have nights where I'd be out till midnight because that was really when, you know, you're having those conversations with different uh, politicians or staffers on the Hill, because that's kind of how uh, the business ran. And that sometimes limits women in regards to, you know, they have responsibilities for their family, um, taking care of children or caregiving for parents. And so sometimes women weren't always included in these different outings, whether it was dinner or golf, things like that. So ensuring that you navigate it with coming in and being bold at the table of meetings and saying, you know, I can't make that late night dinner, but here's how we can discuss this right now in this meeting during our work hours. So I think definitely part of it with all of the different industries is setting boundaries, um, whether that is when you're going to respond to emails, um, how you're going to uh, be present, and if any of your personal life is affecting your work life, I think it's always good to be empathetic about that. But something that I think is really important in these male dominated industries is taking the time to educate your male coworkers because, you know, a lot of it is there's always good intentions, but they don't understand the impact that you're having. So one of the examples I use to help explain this is if you're walking on a sidewalk on the street and you bump into someone on the sidewalk and you hurt them, you didn't mean to bump into them. You didn't mean to hurt them, but you did have the impact of hurting them. So you should apologize and learn. Um, and your lesson learned there would be maybe to look up and see who's around you. So I think that's a good way to help navigate um, male dominated industries and also make it better, uh, a better working environment than what you found. I think I think that is perfect. Um, I love the analogy of bumping into somebody and not really meaning to. Um, so that's that's really great. I think better communication is really important yeah. and setting boundaries is very important, like you said. Um, if we educate our male counterparts as to, you know, why we can't be there and create champions in these male counterparts that are really, uh, will be a voice for us, could be very, very important at those meetings that we couldn't attend. 
Absolutely. And something too with, you know, the male dominated industries is currently many of the managers, senior leaders are men. And so, you know, we need to get more women into those spaces. But for the current uh, timeline, we need to ensure that those men are aware of how they can be better allies and help um, promote women from within and increase the allyship. Yeah, completely agree. Did you know that there is an increase in the number of women leaving the tech industry? As a woman-owned business, Directions Training has made it our mission and passion to change this statistic. That's why Jennifer created this podcast. We showcase insight from everyday women for everyday women in the tech industry. Do you know other people that would benefit from tuning in? Share the link and help us drive the advancement of women in the tech industry. Do you have a journey or know of someone that our listeners would benefit from hearing about? Reach out to us at directionstraining.com slash podcast. Don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and wherever you find your podcasts. Now, back to the show. So I know we're both passionate about inclusion. We touched on it a little bit. Um, can you share your thoughts on focusing on intersectionality in your inclusive programs? How, how do we do better? Yeah, absolutely. So at AWS, I'm a co-director of the uh, Community Engagement Committee with our Women Affinity Group, which Affinity Groups, if you're not familiar, are employee resource groups. So essentially, our purpose is to help identify just different challenges that women face, but also help to escalate that to leadership and provide processes to tackle any of these challenges. But intersectionality is so important um, for these inclusion programs because, you know, when we come to work, we're not just our gender. Um, we're complex human beings. So you're also bringing to work, you know, your race, your religious background, um, sexual orientation, if you're an introvert or an extrovert, if you're a veteran or if you're disabled, um, and even things like if you're a caregiver or first if you've made the choice to be child free. So, Focusing on these different intersectionalities is really important for our inclusion program. And we had an event, um, Women in the Workplace, recently. And when we are focusing on that, the report talks a lot about Black women and how they are actually impacted way more than any type of um, any other race of women, because not only are they dealing with the stressors of the pandemic, but they're also dealing with the stress of the racial tensions and social um, injustice that's happening around the United States. And so really focusing on, you know, not just gender, but also the person as a whole has been really important um, to help also open the eyes of other people. So, you know, I am I identify as a white woman. And so it's been a learning journey for me as well, because even when I looked at Equal Pay Day, and this was actually at a previous company, I posted in our, our Slack channel and I was like, happy equal pay day, you know, we're 70% or 70 cents on the dollar uh, for a white male. And like, we're going to continue to fight this. And there was a Latina woman that actually reached out to me and uh, educated me essentially on the fact that, you know, the 70 cents on the dollar is white women, not necessarily viewing the actual data for black women and Latina women. So taking those moments to have really honest conversations about, you know, we're more than just our gender and we have different obstacles is really important to help in these different programs to make people feel more included. That is so, so true. Wow. You know, sometimes we don't think of all of those intersectionalities that come into play. Um, women are not all equal, you know, mm -hmm. even within the women gender, you have, you know, like you're saying, Black, Latino, other women come from different backgrounds, come from different um, environments, they are getting different pay, they're, you know, treated differently. So we really need to make sure that we are very inclusive with everybody. And really, I've learned, you know, over the years, as we talk more about this, and how I understand how important inclusion is, is to give everybody a voice. Like you mentioned, yeah. somebody could be an introvert or an extrovert. So somebody who's an extrovert would always talk up at meetings, but others who are introverts might not. But to give them a different way to give feedback and give their ideas, because they are still important, even though they may not feel comfortable to talk in a group. 
So yeah, very, very, very true. I love, I love how you position that and how important it is. Yeah, absolutely. So another area of passion for both of us is diversity. We talked about diversity. It doesn't need to be just a checkbox. It needs to be uh, really bringing in different thoughts, ideas, people of all races, of all genders, of all sexual orientation, doesn't really matter, but bringing those perspectives to the table, which really enriches an organization. Um, So how do you think diversity is critical for improving an organization's security posture? Because you focus in that area. Give us some thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. So just like you said, to echo you, I definitely, you know, diversity is so important for not only just, you know, including people and helping to improve equity, but also in terms of business outcomes, it's been proven over and over again, the more diverse your organization is, the more likely you are to hit your business outcomes and be profitable. Um, And when it comes to organizations and their security posture, something that has become increasingly more important uh, for security is having that diversity of thought. So, you know, when we're walking in and looking at diversity, we're not necessarily looking at people's looks or their race and their background. Really, the heart of it is we're looking for diversity of thought because, you know, people carrying out these attacks, they don't come looking one kind of way or from one specific background. The hackers are coming from lots of different backgrounds from lots of different parts of the world. And so in order to mirror that, it's really important for organizations to have cybersecurity teams or cloud security teams that can mirror the actual world and can provide those diverse perspectives in terms of, you know, how there might be a wider range of cyber threats. So, for example, um, you know, the ransomware attacks are increasing, as we've seen, and increasing cyber resiliency is super important. But another way that we've seen a lot of um, malicious actors come in is through phishing attacks. And if you're not familiar with phishing, um, it's essentially when you get different links via email, text, um, whatever type of communication it might be saying, hey, Jennifer, you haven't updated your password and you know we're not happy about it from your boss's point of view maybe. And so then you get nervous and you click on the link and then they have access to your data based on certain scripts running or um, whatever they're trying to access. So phishing is something that I think is really interesting um, and social engineering, which essentially is asking people for their personal information. And, you know, the way that those attacks are going to happen and people respond are going to be a lot different depending on your background. So, you know, whether it's socioeconomic, race, et cetera. If, you know, your team is made up of mainly one certain type of person, they're not necessarily going to be thinking about the different perspectives of um, how maybe an an Asian woman would respond to a phishing link versus maybe a, um, you know, 60-year-old veteran and just the different perspectives. So, A lot of what's really important about this is that, you know, people are coming from all different types of backgrounds. And so with having those people on your team, you're going to be able to create more secure solutions. So to help your organization and protect your employees, but also earn trust with your customers as well. That's great. And I I think organizations need to really think about that diverse team. To have that diverse team to think about security of the organization, because things are really, really crazy. And, you know, phishing is, it seems sometimes so real and it's not, you yeah. know, it's its those people on the dark web that are out to catch you. Yeah. Yeah. And so it, it can be scary, I mean, for an organization. So diversity and critical thinking is so important for an organization's security posture. So that's great. Yeah, that's great. And I think right. it's important too. Um, so for noting diversity of like different career paths too, because obviously you know some people might get a cybersecurity or a computer science degree from the university, or others might just self-teach um, and learn skills with some different online courses, and that also helps provide different perspectives as well. Because you know if not everyone needs to have necessarily a degree in it if they can come and be a self starter and learn that's also a really good quality to have on your team as well yeah i i actually met a hacker 
a while ago, and yeah. he was then hired by the federal government because yeah. <laughs> he had these skills that, you know, maybe wasn't taught so well in school, but he had real world experience. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of crazy. Um, so I learned a lot about empathy during the pandemic. That was, you know, one of my big aha moments, even though, you know, I'm all, I consider myself an empathetic person, but when you're running a business, sometimes you have to keep things, you know, very much in line, but the pandemic kind of threw things everywhere. So it wasn't that easy. And then I learned really people are dealing with so much during the pandemic um, that empathy was so, so important. So why do you think it's important to have honest, empathetic conversations in the workplace? What What is your experience? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, one of the things with um, the pandemic that's been really interesting is I think it's highlighted that we have more things going on than just our work. Um, and it's helped people really recognize that we're, we're all humans. We are not just a security consultant or a CEO or a janitor. We have families. Um, we have certain interests and different concerns as well. And so I think the great part about these honest, open conversations in the workplace is it really helps teams feel more um, open to, you know, sharing more about themselves, but also learning how they can support others. Uh, as as um, as an example, you know, I've uh, dealt with a lot of coworkers that, you know, maybe they are not showing up to meetings or not being prompt, and instead of necessarily coming from a place of anger, like why isn't this person? not showing up, they're disrespecting my time, coming from a place of curiosity and wondering, you know, what is going on in their life. And I actually had a scenario like this somewhat recently where I had um, a male co coworker not show up to my meeting and it felt disrespectful in the moment. I was like, does he not respect me as a woman? Um, and that's why he didn't show up because it was a very important meeting. And so someone my team was like, you should escalate this to his manager. It's not okay. But I kind of took a step back and thought, you know, I don't really know what's going on with this person. So I reached out to him personally and asked, you know, if there was a reason why he didn't show up and he had a family member in the hospital. And so I think that's why it's super important to have these empathetic conversations because that helped me like really give me perspective and remind myself, you know, this person isn't just their job. They have other things going on and sometimes they're emergencies. So they're not necessarily going to contact you to let you know they're not going to be on the meeting. So I think that is really helpful. And also in terms of leadership, if senior leaders can open up and be vulnerable about different things they're going through, I think it really helps build community and a sense of belongingness that you feel that support with your employer. Yeah, I think that's a great example is not to jump to the conclusions, to really yeah. be open minded, ask questions, you know, like you did. You took a step back and you said, you know, was there a reason that you didn't join the meeting rather than saying, you know, I really took that negatively. You should have joined or, you know, however you would. Yeah. Phrase. Yeah, there's different ways to approach it. And that empathetic way really makes a difference. It's It's really important in the workplace. I agree. Absolutely. And I think it just reminds you to kind of have grace and patience with mm -hmm. everyone around you because you mm -hmm. stop and you know what's going on in your life. So you're, you know, fully aware of those things, but you need to stop and think about what everyone else is dealing with as well. And we, we have a whole new world now because people are working from home. So you see yeah. dogs and cats and, exactly. you know, children, everybody, you know, as part of the environment and you have to be really open to say, you know, that is the world we're living in today, you know, and through the pandemic, the kids were home and the parents still had to work, you know, yeah, so absolutely. you just have to, yeah, adjust. Yeah, mm -hmm. very, very neat. So remote work, like we talked about is, you know, I mean, our company has been remote for many, many years, but um, it is becoming somewhat of a normal, even though there's some um, hybrid situations in many organizations. But what are some best practices to be more inclusive in this remote world where you might think that you're on an island or you're by yourself? Yeah. You know, how how do you in your organization bring people together more inclusively um, so that they feel like, you know, they're part of a team? Yeah, absolutely. And, 
it definitely seems like more companies are moving towards remote, whether it's, you know, they're listening to their employees, employees are asking to be remote because they they find better work-life balance or, um, you know, just with not having the cost of a brick and mortar office, but definitely some learnings uh, we've discovered at AWS just in terms of being more inclusive. Um, something that I like that we really focus on in terms of meetings is we do roundtables. So we actually will start with the least tenured person on the team um, to encourage them to speak up. So we'll do essentially start, stop, and continue, which if you're not familiar with that process, it's um, when you do retrospectives on different projects, you'll start with you know what's going well, um, talk about what you want to continue to do better, and then stop whatever process is you know not helping the team for whatever reason. And I think, I think these roundtables are really helpful because they actually call out each person one by one, and it helps give introverts that space to speak up um, without feeling like, well, I guess without them feeling nervous um, in a team setting and also ensuring that extroverts don't dominate the conversation. I myself is, am an extrovert, so it's something I've had to practice as well. Um, but I think as in terms of also being more inclusive, again, being empathetic and vulnerable with others to share what you're doing and also talking about people's need for flexibility. Um, something that I've noticed a lot in terms of being inclusive, especially in the new remote aspect of working, is understanding people's flexibility for their hours and tailoring according to that. So oh, I actually just got on a new project where the team is located in Asia. And so I've shifted my hours up to working um, till seven and then ending around three. And my manager has been really accepting of that um, because he understands that, you know, there's specific times that we need to look at and provide flexibility for people. And I think that's also really helpful for women in tech because, like we've mentioned, there's a lot of different things outside of the world workplace going on, whether it's caregiving um, or other personal challenges. So I think that's something that's super helpful. Um, and then my last thing that I always suggest to people, and I actually um, practice this daily, is, you know, challenging your own personal assumptions. So leading with curiosity and kind of stopping, like we've mentioned before, but wondering, you know, what is going on with this person and how can I be there for them? And a, an example that I think really interesting in terms of ex introverts and extroverts um, is having that conversation with how people want to be recognized. I, as an extrovert, love being recognized in a group of people because I get excited and feed off that energy. But I have some coworkers who that, that would be their worst nightmare. <laughs> like they, they would much rather get an email that's private saying, you know, you're doing a great job. Um, so really challenging your own personal assumptions and also asking how you can be there for people and support them. I love that because, you know, I always talk about unconscious biases and we we all have them no matter yeah. who we are. Right. And yeah. so when you stop and you introspect and say, OK, how am I thinking about this? Is this the right way to think about it? Have I you know, challenged myself to think about it differently? That is so great. And it's so great that you practice that on a daily basis because it is a learned skill. It's not something that comes intuitively because our unconscious bias could take over and say, you know, oh, this is why this is happening. You know, we know it. But until we introspect and challenge our, our thinking, we don't really know. Absolutely. And it's tough, too, because, you know, mm -hmm. you may stop and be self-reflective and you're like, wow, did I really, really just like have that thought of preferring someone like me? But you have to challenge yourself really every day to uh, work against it and, you know, challenge your assumptions. Yeah, no, that's very true. Um, so can you share with us any lessons that you've learned in your career that have really made an impact on you and that we could learn from? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I've learned a lot during my my career so far. I feel like I'm learning every single day new things, whether it's uh, interpersonal skills or tech skills. But definitely my biggest lessons are to be bold in your career and even if it's incremental. So it doesn't need to be, you know, quitting your job today and starting your dream business. 
it can be a 5% being bold and and, you know, looking into a skill that you've always been interested in or reading up on an industry that you are passionate about. Um, I think that's something that's really helpful because it's going to help you learn and have that curiosity every single day so that you can grow um, in your career. So I think that's really important. And also telling people what you need. So being bold, bold in the sense of telling your manager what you need and what boundaries you need so that you can really create the life that you're looking for in your workplace. So I think that's really helpful. And then my other lesson that I always like to um, tell, especially women in tech, is, is to use your communication skills to your advantage. So like I mentioned before, I don't have a degree in computer science, um, but I've gained all these different skills from the different industries I've been in that have really given me an advantage in my current role in tech because not only do I have tech skills, but I also have refined communication skills. So from my time in lobbying, building different uh, relationship building and communication skills, and I have analytic skills from my time at the law firm, and then also stakeholder management and influencing from when I was an account manager and project manager at a tech startup. So I think it's really great for women to focus on the skills that they already have and use that to their advantage while they're building their tech skills um, and really honing in on understanding that interpersonal skills are so important in tech. And currently there is kind of a gap in those skills. And I always like to explain to people that it doesn't matter if you could, you know, architect and implement and deploy the next Amazon or Uber if you can't explain your vision. So I always like to tell women to definitely use communication um, skills to their advantage when they're applying and interviewing at different com companies. Those are great lessons. Thank you for that. That's that's yeah. great. Um, all right, let's take a detour and talk a little bit about travel because I love travel and I, I think we know. might be getting back to it now. <laughs> so what is your most favorite place that you've traveled to and why? Uh, this is a tough one. Uh, it's hard to I pick love, one, I know. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I love traveling and actually pre-COVID, I tried to at least go on multiple trips a year if I could with my um, paid time off um, but I was thinking about it and probably my favorite place I've been to is Jaipur, India um, which is the capital of Rajasthan and it's called the pink city because a lot of the different buildings are painted pink or kind of like an off color orange and so it's just beautiful um, but there's also so much life in the city and the people were so kind I went with my mom and sister in 2019 um, and we actually when we were in Japur did a hot air balloon uh, ride over the rural farmlands of the city and I just thought it was so neat because not only was it beautiful but a lot of the villagers would come out and wave to us and some would run up to their rooftops and wave and then a lot of the families and kids ran out to where we landed and all wanted to greet us and invite us to their homes for tea. So I would say that's definitely my favorite place. The people were just so friendly and it was also beautiful and just so much rich culture as well. I love that. I'm going to have to add that to my list, my bucket list. <laughs> yes, it's great. It just, you know, sometimes people can make the biggest difference, right? They just make you feel at home. They make you feel that you're part of their culture and part of their life. And you just want to be there. It just warms your heart. Absolutely. And honestly, just seeing like the smiling faces of the kids when the mm -hmm. hot air balloon was going by, like, it just brightens your, your day. Yeah, that's amazing. That's great. So in closing, Sarah, this has been amazing, uh, our time together. But in closing, what what advice would you give to a woman considering a career in, in the tech industry? Since you've, you know, come, you started yeah. with not being in tech, but now you love it. What advice can you give to a woman considering a career? Yeah, absolutely. There's so many different ways to go with this. But my overall number one piece of advice is to apply for the job, even if you don't meet all the criteria. There is a stat that women only apply normally to jobs when they meet 100% of their criteria. And as we've all seen, some different job descriptions have 
insane criteria like entry level developer and they want 10 years of experience. So do not hesitate if you see a job that you're interested in apply. And one of my tips with that as well is if you are a little hesitant and you want to get some background information on the role, go on LinkedIn and search for women in the organization that have either the same role or are on on a team that's similar and ask them for some time to kind of learn more about the job and to make you feel more comfortable. But I definitely just think you should go for it now because the longer you wait for the industry, you know, continues to grow and be more complex. So it's just better to dive in as soon as you can if you're interested in it. That's great advice. Great advice. Just do it, jump in, yeah. do it. And don't be afraid if you're not 100% qualified, because that is so true. They they do say men, even though they're not 100% qualified, will apply for the job and they'll say, you know, I could do 60% of it. I can wing yep. the rest of it. I'm yeah. confident enough that I can do it. But women don't always have that confidence and they have to meet the criteria 100% before they'll apply. So this is an absolutely great piece of advice for women yeah, to build absolutely. that confidence muscle. And I always like to tell people like, it's okay to be afraid. That's, yeah. you know, it's a natural fear that you, you might have going into a new industry, but don't let it stop you from joining something that could honestly be life-changing for you. That's right. That's right. That's great. Sarah, this has been such a pleasure. Yes. I really enjoyed every minute of our time together and I'd love to have you on in the future. Yeah. Um, but, you know, in closing, can you share with our listeners how they can get a hold of you? Yeah, absolutely. I am more than happy to talk to anyone um, of the listeners of the podcast. I always want to help uh, mentor and provide support as I can. So feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. My name is Sarah Curry, C-U-R-R-E-Y. Um, or you can email me at currysarah 28com at gmail.com. So curry, C-U-R-R-E-Y, Sarah, S-A-R-A-H, 28 at gmail.com. And I also just want to put out, plug out there that AWS is hiring. Um, my team specifically in cyber and security is hiring. And so if anyone is interested in working for AWS, uh, please feel free to contact me and put your application in. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you again, Sarah. I look forward to our next discussion. But in the meantime, I was honored to have you on the show. So thank yeah. you again. Thanks so much, Jennifer. And I just want to say thank you for inviting me. And thank you so much for all, for all the work that you do um, to help women in tech. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for listening to Tech in the Right Direction. Please take a minute to subscribe or follow so that you never miss an episode. Also, don't forget to like, share, and comment. Thank you. See you next week. From IT skill enhancements to end user adoption training, Directions Training is your resource to help optimize the effectiveness of your technology investments. Over half a million students have taken advantage of our wide selection of technology and business training solutions covering the most popular applications today, such as Microsoft 365, Azure, Windows 10, and more. As a podcast listener, we invite you to take advantage of an exclusive offer. Receive 30 days of free access to our Microsoft official curriculum on-demand courses for IT professionals or end users. Visit us at www.directionstraining.com slash podcast to claim this offer today. Hurry, this offer is only available for a limited time. Success is a journey. Ask for directions.